Hi, my name is Lauren Templeton, and you are listening to Investing the Templeton Way. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about investing. In this podcast, I will be interviewing some of the greatest minds from the investment community and exploring topics ranging from international markets to behavioral finance. To learn more, please visit us at investingthetempletonway.com. The information presented in this podcast or available on the website is not intended as and shall not be construed as financial advice. This podcast is produced for entertainment value. Investing is inherently risky, and I encourage you to seek financial advice from a professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Thanks for listening. I want to welcome everyone today to the Investing the Templeton Way podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton, and I'm so excited about today's guest, which is Perth Toll. Perth is the founder of the Life and Liberty Indexes and creator of the Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index. The ticker is FRDM. The Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index is the world's first freedom-weighted emerging markets equity index. Prior to forming Life and Liberty Indexes, Perth was a private wealth advisor at Fidelity Investments. Prior to Fidelity, Perth lived and worked in Beijing and Hong Kong, where her observations led her to explore the relationship between freedom and markets. Welcome, Perth. Thanks for having me, Lauren. It's an honor to be here with you. Yeah, I'm so excited for several reasons. First, um, I'll let you know that you were the first female on my show, which is <laughs> really exciting to me. There are not a ton of women in the industry. I just spoke on Sunday night to a group of high school women who are interested in finance and investing and and had to share wow, the news cool. with them. Yeah, that, um, you know, all the women represent 46% of employees in financial services, only 16% in executive positions. So Mm -hmm. it is so great to have a successful female on the podcast. But the second reason um, that I'm so excited is I love what you're doing. It's such a unique unique product, having a thematic ETF. And I happen to love the theme, which is freedom. My listeners may not know, but I know you do, that one of the main funding areas of all three of the Templeton Foundations is individual freedom and free markets. My great uncle, Sir John Templeton, valued and believed in individual freedom, free enterprise, because he thought it unleashed human progress. And a number of his investments overseas capitalized on this as economies opened up in his lifetime. So please spend a few minutes telling me about your background and what led you to create Life and Liberty Indexes and the Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index. Yeah, thanks. And and I do know about Sir John Templeton's, um, uh, you know, words and actions to promote freedom around the world. So maybe you should post his letter with this podcast as well once you uh, once we're done here but that that is yeah something that you made me aware of and I and I so appreciate that yeah that's a great idea and I'll add that to the show notes so I grew up in both China and the US and I was born in Beijing and then I came to the US around age 9 and I went back to live in Hong Kong after college and when I went back to Hong Kong I traveled throughout mainland China while I was there uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and so forth. And I saw the difference that freedom made in my life as well as in the market in these various places. So the Hong Kong market being different from the mainland market at the time and the U.S. market. So I realized that policies and governance have an impact on the, the society and also on, on markets in, in, a, in, a, in any given country. Um, One of the issues that really hit home with me was the one child policy in China. And this is a policy that said, you know, every family can only have one child. And it was instituted from the year that I was born to 30 years after that. 
then they relaxed it to two children and now to three children. Mm -hmm. But because of the one child policy being there for 30 years, there's 30 million missing women in China due to official Chinese estimates. And this policy changed the entire culture of my generation. So now that they're allowed to have three children, most people are still only having one or maybe none at all. And China is in the worst demographic crisis in the world. So that is the policy that most had an impact on me because I saw the profound impact it had on my generation and the women in my generation. Yeah, of course. And I've heard you note before that this policy and the impact that it's had on your generation has really impacted China in in several ways that people might not think of. First of all, um, maybe China's more militarized than it would be without this policy. And secondly, that it has promoted human trafficking within China, which is something I never considered, but makes so much sense that the gender imbalance would do that. Yes. And so that's an issue that is a personal freedom issue, you know, reproductive rights. But also, I think economic freedoms are important. And, um, you know, our data providers, the Cato Institute and the Fraser Institute, like to say that freedoms are like parts of an automobile, that you can't have a steering wheel without a transmission, the car still won't run. So you have to have both personal and economic freedoms. And sometimes these personal freedom issues can act as a leading indicator of where economic freedoms are going in a country. And that is what happened with China. We saw these personal freedom issues, personal freedom deteriorating in China in the, in recent, in the recent past. Uh, and then we saw the crackdown on tech companies, on entrepreneurs, on private business in general, and just the heavy handedness from which um, the, the leadership is now kind of cracking down on markets. And so This acted as a leading indicator for for those economic freedom issues. Yeah, I see that. And that is very clear that freer countries in terms of economics would be more efficient. They would not have central planning, et cetera. But can you just expand on that uh, concept a little bit for guests that have not put those two? I mean, I feel like I was you know, raised in a household because of John Templeton that we talked about individual and free markets so much that it's such a natural idea for me that, well, of course, stock markets would perform better in a free your country, et cetera. But can you expand on that idea a little bit for people who haven't thought through that? Yeah, sure. So so when a country is more free, our thesis is that they'll experience more sustainable growth. So it's less Mm -hmm. debt-driven and state-mandated growth. For example, like we saw with Evergrande in China, Mm -hmm. Um, China tends to be, I'm not trying to pick on China, it tends to be um, the country I'm most familiar with in the emerging markets. And also, It's just exhibit A for a lot of these issues right now. And also it's the biggest emerging market in most uh, emerging markets, indexes and funds. And so, for example, Evergrande, right? We didn't see the the debt issues or the accounting issues until it was too late to fix. And in freer markets, you have less of this because there's more transparent accounting and there's more transparent ownership structures. And you see the companies growing more sustainably instead of, you know, completely dependent on either state spending or some kind of state mandate that that favors the industry. Yeah. And then they also recover faster from drawdowns because you have feedback loops on the ground and people are more incentivized to innovate and be creative and solve problems on their own. One example that a lot of people in, in the West can, can uh, relate to on this is when COVID first happened in the United States, we were saying, okay, don't buy masks because we're going to run out for the healthcare workers. But nobody predicted that people would start selling masks on Etsy, that you know, Gap and Brooks Brothers would still start selling masks. Mm-hmm. And so private business solved the problem and the government didn't have to come in and ban people from buying masks like they thought they did. So in a freer market, the people on the ground who know the best solutions for for problems that others face can improve other people's lives, solve these problems much more efficiently than a central government can. So that way they're more um, resilient and can respond better and be more flexible to market trends and the needs in the market. Absolutely. So your yeah. thesis is that a freer market should produce alpha, that there's some type of freedom premium. Is, you know, 
how how is your performance? Is there really a freedom premium? Yeah, so the FRDM strategy has been trading for about three and a half years now. Um, and if you compare it with uh, broad emerging markets, market cap weighted indices, which typically have about 40% in autocracies like China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, Russia now having been marked to zero, we do have outperformance in all time periods that we can see. So year to date, we're outperforming by about, we're down half as much as the broad-based uh, market cap weighted emerging markets indices. One year we're outperforming and three year we're, we're outperforming and since inception we're outperforming. So we have in this time period seen very, actually very stark outperformance um, if you compare us to something like EEM, VWO or IEMG. And I think that's because of the extreme kind of events that we've had over the last couple of years. First COVID and then the recovery from COVID, which freer markets outperformed in the emerging market space. And we outperformed broad emerging markets, emerging markets ESG, and also ex-China emerging markets. So it wasn't just a China story. And then we had the, the war in Russia uh, invading Ukraine. And that, I think, opened a lot of investors' eyes to autocracy risk, which wasn't really a thing at, at the top of investor minds previously. Mm -hmm. And I think investors looked at that and said, wow, this worldwide coordinated effort to contain Russia through financial markets using sanctions and whatnot is, is a huge tail risk, actually, for investors who are investing in autocracies, mm -hmm. especially aggressive autocracies. So I think people said, what's the next risk here? And China, obviously, being about 30% of most emerging market funds is the, the next big risk. And, and we've seen China continue to see sustained underperformance over the last the recent past. And so I think people started to realize that autocracy risk matters. And that's why they're starting to invest in this way. Yeah, well, congratulations on the great performance. I'm not surprised that there is or you're seeing a freedom premium. You know, do you want to comment a little bit about having a market cap weighted index in a developed um, market versus a market cap weighted index in an emerging market? Because you know, in developed markets, there's there's not so much of a need to consider political risk. In emerging markets, you definitely need to consider political risk when you're investing. And so do you want to comment on that and why it may make sense to use a market cap weighted index in a more developed market, but not as much sense to use it in an emerging market? Yeah, absolutely. So market cap weighting does create a very tradable product. So you have the biggest weights to the biggest companies, which are typically the most liquid. And so most indexes are constructed this way. Uh, and market cap weighting is a, the standard, you know, indexing methodology because of that. And in developed markets, you know, this is a very efficient and very tradable way to get exposure to, um, to most developed market stocks. In emerging markets, though, when you market cap weight, because the biggest emerging markets are like China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are all in the top 10 before Russia went to zero. There's also a lot of other autocracies in the universe, Egypt, Turkey, UAE, Qatar, and so forth. The emerging markets are just full of autocracies. That's the nature of the universe. And the biggest ones are usually the worst human rights offenders in the world. And so instead of getting this, you know, very efficient, tradable product, you just end up funding autocracies. And, you know, for, I had a, a Russian client when I was at Fidelity who told me, I don't want to invest in Russia because it's like funding terrorism. Mm -hmm. And so I really created this for investors like him who want that emerging markets exposure without funding autocracies and also giving a higher weight to the freer markets. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because it's an opportunity for investors to align their values with their investments but in this case, the results, they haven't had to pay anything for doing that. There's actually been a premium for investing in freer countries. And I just wanted to add for my listeners, when we're talking about emerging markets, um, MSCI considers uh, 24 countries as emerging. Um, and of course, we usually think of the BRICS, which are Brazil, Russia, 
India, China, and South Africa, but there are 19 other countries. And I think you said, Perth, that you're looking at 26 countries. Is that correct? Yeah. So we use a universe that currently has about 26 countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, we first screen, screen out for like countries that are too small and too illiquid. So for example, Czech Republic is in our universe but it's too small to include mm -hmm. and Peru is in our universe, but it's too illiquid. And those are both very free countries. And there's a, other, you know, less free countries that are screened out as well in this process. And then we end up with about an 18 country eligible universe. And these are the countries that are big enough and tradable enough to be in the product. And those are the countries that we apply freedom weighting to. So our freedom weighting is applied on the 18 eligible universe countries. Um, and that is 100% freedom weighted. It's not an overlay and it's not a tilt. It's just 100%. The freer it is, the more weight it gets. And the top freest countries out of that you know, 18 country eligible universe are included. If you don't make it into the top you know, freest, higher than average, then it's excluded. So countries like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, have never been included in the index and are currently not included. Okay, that makes sense. So what are the top freest countries out of that emerging market pool of countries? Yeah, so at the time of rebalance, we rebalance once a year after the um, the, the data comes out with the freedom metrics. Um, at the time of rebalance, Taiwan was the highest weighted country based on just freedom weighting. Um, and then South Korea, Chile, and Poland. And, you know, we're proud to say these are the countries that Poland, especially being very undervalued right now, um, is also a country that really stood up for freedom in Ukraine when the war first happened. And they've been the country that has taken in the most refugees as well. Of course, we're seeing a relief rally today after a missile hit yesterday. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's a bit of a relief. But Chile this year has been one of the best performing emerging markets, surprisingly, because of their commodities exposure across the board. Right. Um, Copper, lithium, et yes. cetera. Uh, but Chile just elected a leftist president, right? Yes. That plans to steer the economy away from market-friendly policies. So how... How would you anticipate this affecting the ranking and the ETF in the future? Yeah, so we, I actually anticipated that this would affect the ranking sooner. And I do anticipate that it still will in the near future, um, for example, in this year's metrics. But in talking with the data providers at Cato and Fraser, they said that until policies actually change on the ground, mm -hmm. it's not going to affect their scoring. So yes, there was a very far left government that was elected um, and that's the new regime now. Um, but we can see through kind of votes and referendums that have gone on that their institutions and checks and balances are still at work. Mm -hmm. And so until this government is able to actually enact change and um, cause policy changes on the ground. And those policy changes cause actual changes in people's lives. That's when it will affect the scoring. So there is um, kind of, we're kind of in a limbo right now waiting for Chile to see what's going to happen. But we do see in these kind of, especially South American countries, and that tend to kind of revert to the less free South American mean. <laughs> it is a, a wave and it's going backwards right now. And Brazil was another example from this year. We see that their institutions in the very freer ones like Chile and less so Brazil are still, still at play. So the, the institutions are still strong. And so we still see checks and balances on executive power. And so even though you know, Chile has a very leftist president and Brazil has also a somewhat, you know, left president now who's been in jail for corruption and so forth, that their other institutions that are keeping the checks on those powers are still working. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I want to peel back the onion a little bit on the freedom metrics, I believe is what you called it. And it's produced by Cato and Fraser Institute. Is that correct? Yes. And is this done on an annual basis? Yes. So um, they come out with the annual country scores for about 162 countries, usually around December. 
And so we rebalanced in January. And um, these guys, the reason why we use this particular data set by Cato and Fraser is because one, it is the most complete data set out there. If you use something like Freedom House, which we do use in one of our rules, and I'll talk about that, but um, Freedom House is a committee. It's a black box. There's no transparent methodology that goes behind their index um, and their data set. And Cato and Fraser, on the other hand, have a transparent methodology. You can see exactly what third-party data they're using and how they're using it and how they're weighted. So we like that transparency in the methodology. We like that it's completely objective and third-party and quantitative. The other thing I like about this data set is that they don't, Cato and Fraser are organizations that don't take any government grants from any country. So we saw the debacle with uh, World Bank in China. Are you talking about the ease of doing business report? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that report, we were actually using that report. That was part of the 79 variables. Oh, no. That, yeah. That went into Cato and Fraser's country scoring. And we had to, you know, they had to find substitutes. So, so for our listeners, we should say the ease of doing business report was a report created um, by the World Bank Group. And it was discontinued recently, I think sometime yeah. in 2021, um, following the release of an independent audit of data irregularities. Um, but I think, you know, leadership at banks were pressuring experts to manipulate the results, et cetera. So that report went away and a lot of people relied on this report. In fact, that's one of the things the Templeton Foundation is is talking to people about. What do, what do we do now that the report has gone away? So um, that's the background. Yeah. And that was mostly because um, China was a funder of World Bank. And okay. so they were pressuring World Bank to manipulating their kind of scoring. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, so that's why it's best to use a, uh, a data set that is not funded, funded by any, yeah. uh, any government organization. And, you know, using Freedom House as an example, again, it is funded by the U.S. government mostly. So mm -hmm. even U.S. government, we try to, we try to be completely unfunded by governments. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I used this particular data set. And um, we are completely independent from them. So we don't have any influence in the scoring at all. Well, what happens if something, something happens on the ground in one of these countries in between the report being released and the metrics being refreshed? How do you monitor that? I noted in a podcast that I'd listened to that you were on, you talked about Turkey in 2018. So can you kind of walk us through uh, that scenario and what yes. might happen? So this is a passive indexing strategy. We don't make uh, like ad hoc, you know, changes throughout the year in mm -hmm. response to things that happen. So for example, with, you know, Chile and their ref referendum, we didn't, you know, increase exposure after the vote went pro freedom, you know, with Brazil, when the, when they had an orderly election and that was, that was good. Um, we didn't increase exposure. So mm -hmm. we, throughout the year do not make changes. However, at the time of rebalance, if there has been a very drastic decrease in freedoms in any particular country, we do have a rule called the freedom momentum decline rule. Mm -hmm. And that is meant to catch the very quick declines that happen. Because what we found is that when freedom increases, it happens very gradually, typically. But when it decreases, it happens very quickly. So this is like a stop loss kind mm -hmm. of a cell discipline rule. And we do use Freedom House for this rule because of their, because they are a committee and so they can react quickly. Um, so, so for that particular rule, you know, uh, it, our rule is if it falls more than five points on the Freedom House scale in any given year, that even if a country is included, it would get excluded out of the index. So we would drop the country in that case. And Turkey is the only country that has ever triggered this rule in the index in 2018. That was before the ETF started trading in 2019. So since the ETF started trading, we have not um, had this rule triggered by any country. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Can you give the audience an idea of what the metrics are that, that Cato and Fraser are looking at? Um, because you said there were 79 of these different yes. inputs. What, what type of things do they look at? 
Yeah, so I categorize these into three buckets, civil freedoms, political freedoms, and economic freedoms. Civil freedoms are things like terrorism, trafficking, torture, women's rights. There's five proxies for women's rights, including a missing women proxy mm-hmm. um, that accounts for like what we were talking about at the beginning here. Political freedoms are things like independent judiciary, civil procedure, criminal procedure, freedom of speech, media, expression, religion, assembly, and so forth. We saw some of these freedoms erode during COVID in a lot of countries. So that is the kind of the category that's catching those erosions in freedom. And then economic freedoms are things we're all familiar with, like uh, taxation, rule of law, private property rights, business regulations, sound money, um, freedom to trade internationally. The more trade, the better, um, and the less tariffs and non-tariff trade barriers. So these are kind of a, a sample of all the metrics. There are 79 of them, and they are about half of them are personal freedoms, which are the civil and political, and about half are economic freedoms. And each variable is equal weighted to get the composite score per country. And we take the composite score into account for our weightings. Well, thank you for explaining that. I was about to ask how COVID impacted these um, (laughs) (laughs) rankings. Yes. So that was was basically impacting, you know, things like freedom of assembly, freedom Mm -hmm. of movement, and so forth. So I'm assuming, um, did it impact all countries the same, or were some countries more impacted uh, by their COVID policies? Yeah, definitely some countries were more impacted by others. And um, it was a lot of the developed markets at first, but now as you see, like in China, for example, with Eat Zero COVID, we're seeing a lot more drastic actions in some of these emerging markets as well. Sure. So once you have applied this ranking screen, what do you do? Are you going in and buying individual securities? Yes. So we do buy the top 10 largest, most liquid securities within each included country. Um, We exclude state-owned enterprises just to bring the economic freedom theme all the way through. And there's no other uh, factors on here. We don't have, you know, value or momentum or any other traditional factors. And that's because we wanted to isolate the freedom factor for this flagship product. In the future, we may add things like value or something else. Mm -hmm. But right now we're just, um, we wanted to isolate this because no one else had ever done this before. So it was a brand new kind of concept. And we wanted to see if the market would respond to it. So it's just the top 10 largest, most liquid, non-state-owned companies in each country. And those are market cap weighted within the freedom-weighted country weights. Oh, I see. So um, is there a large industry exposure in any particular industry? Yes, we do have a high exposure to um, technology in the form of semiconductors. So that's Samsung and Taiwan, Taiwan Semiconductor. Semi. Yes. Yeah. And those are such large companies in their countries that if we didn't cap the securities, uh, they would be like 30% of of their country. So we do have a cap on the security level of Mm -hmm. 8% at the time of rebalance. Okay. I'm sure you're watching that Taiwan semi position (laughs) closely (laughs) these days. Yes. I mean, Um, that's a good example of uh, kind of there can be indirect exposure through trade to mm -hmm. unfree markets. So they do have that indirect exposure to China. Mm -hmm. But you see that they are kind of moving out of that, as is the trend. So I I believe soon they're going to be doing some kind of event at the the new plant in Arizona. Right. And so they're also going into India and other other markets. So so you see that, yeah, sometimes we can have indirect exposure through trade. And uh, we believe that is okay. The the more trade, the better. We're not trying to penalize the free trade in in these more free countries. Okay. So you're not penalizing any companies for trading with uh, unfree or less free. Less free countries. Yeah, less free say. excluded countries. Now, there is a rule that says if all of your assets or, or 80% or more of your assets are the same as are basically invested in a company that is in an unfree, uh, a not included market. So, right. um, for example, the company Naspers in South Africa, mm-hmm. they have like most of their market share is 10 cent. Right. So we did exclude them as a result of that. And this is something that actually investors pointed out to us in the beginning. We didn't do that in the first year. And investors pointed this out to us. And we said, well, that makes sense to not have exposure to this company because it is 
like a backdoor way of investing in Tencent. And we didn't want that exposure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So you are you do look at that. And are you purchasing local shares or ADRs? We are purchasing local shares where we can. So it's about mm-hmm. the, the fund is about 80% local shares. And the, the rule there is if a company has both a local share and an ADR, we take whichever is more liquid if it's a new addition. If it's already in the index, then we just take whatever is already in there to avoid unnecessary turnover. So we end up with about 80% local shares. And this is something I'm, thank you for bringing it up because I'm very proud of this because we pay to do global custody in each of these markets, which is a, a the probably the biggest expense in an emerging market fund. But that gives our investors a really good exposure, like a really good capture of the market as a whole in these countries. And so that's something that I, you know, we wanted to do. And, um, and we do give our exposure, you know, our investors that exposure. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. So word about currency exposure, I'm assuming that you think that the sound money will, um, that that's a big component and you don't hedge currency exposure or anything like that. Yeah, we don't hedge currencies because it's so hard to predict and also it's so expensive. But yes, you're right. The the countries that have more sound money are the ones that are included in the um, index. And these are the countries that have historically lower inflation rates. So they have, you know, a little less currency risk in an inflationary environment, but it's not completely like we're not we're not making that prediction. <laughs> they tend to have less historical inflation. One of the thought or questions I had when I was reading about your strategy was whether or not this would work in frontier markets. I think it would work even more uh, so in frontier markets than emerging because you have even lower base to grow from. So that's, that's actually a, an area of huge interest to me. The challenge with frontier markets and bringing something to market for investors is that they're not very tradable. They're yeah. very illiquid. And so, I mean, if we're excluding Peru and Czech Republic, it's going to be mm-hmm. much harder to do Estonia, you know, Lithuania and so forth, uh, you know, Uruguay. So that's the challenge with frontier markets. However, um, you know, we are actually actively working on trying to, to do something there. I don't know how we're going to solve this problem yet. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that's a very exciting place. And when you do, like you said, with developed markets, when you do freedom weighting, it doesn't add a lot of value. You end up with kind of the same country set because they're all pretty free, but in a less tradable way. <laughs> right. But when you do, you know, freedom weighting in frontier markets, you get this beautiful cascade of just very free countries. And, you know, some of these countries are freer than developed markets. So countries like, like Estonia, Uruguay, um, some of these other Baltic countries, they are, you know, ranked higher in freedom score than like United States or Canada. So, (laughs) um, so that, that is a very exciting place because there are some of these very free countries but most people don't invest in them. Most people invest in like uh, Kuwait or Vietnam, you know, some of these less free. Although I do think that Vietnam is, is set to benefit a lot from the China decoupling that's going on. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. I'd love to stay in touch with you on anything you're doing in frontier markets. So do you think the world is becoming less free or more free? Uh, this it happens in waves. So right now we're in a wave of kind of a lot of nationalism, a lot of, you know, super far right wing candidates winning elections like like we just, you know, like we've been seeing in um, Europe and also, you know, in some South American countries, although the, that's that tide is turning now as well. A lot of populism popping up. And so we've been seeing kind of waves seemingly going backwards. Like you mentioned Chile going more Mm -hmm. leftist. But throughout the course of history, freedom has definitely been on an upside upside, uh, trend. So uh, it's definitely become much more free in the, you know, than than in historical past. So I think it's kind of like the stock market where (laughs) in the long run, you know, it, it's, you know, becoming much more free, but in the short run, we can go backwards sometimes. Sure. Do you have a good example of a country that has moved up the freedom ranking a lot? And did it actually correlate with higher investment returns? Yeah. So actually, Taiwan used to be this military dictatorship not too long ago. 
And they have really now become a beacon of democracy in their region. And throughout that time of increasing those, those democratic freedoms, they have actually seen very good stock market returns compared to other neighboring markets like South Korea and, and China. So Taiwan is actually a very good example of that, where they become you know, very, very free as in the emerging markets universe. And they've also seen their stock market reflect that. You don't see that every time, uh, but I think uh, there is a, there's definitely, we believe in, in the freer markets outperforming in the long run. And I think you said Taiwan was one of your largest allocations, right? It is, yes. Okay. At the time of rebalance, it was number one. And then how should we think or you think about uh, invasion risk into Taiwan? Like, do you think about that at all? Or Absolutely. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you for asking that. We do think about that a lot. And, uh, and I look at that as, if you look at what happened with Russia, when Russia invaded, it was the invading country that was hit with the sanctions. And with China, you know, the, a lot of countries are in a united front now already preparing for this and already, you know, knowing they already know what's going to happen if, if they invade. So I think with China, it would be even more swift. The sanctions and the actions would be, it would, it would hurt more because we have more trade with China. But I do think that the world is prepared to act. So the risk there is not Taiwan for investors. It is Taiwan too, but also it is the rest of the world because that would be World War III situation. So there's really no place to hide at that point. But the biggest risk would be China in that situation. So for emerging markets investors, you know, broad cap, market cap weighted emerging markets funds have about the same amount in Taiwan as we have in the freedom weighted emerging markets fund. So the Taiwan allocation is the same, but broad emerging markets funds that have market cap weighting have 30% in China. So that's a lot of concentrated risk in the country of risk in that type of situation. So I would be more concerned about the China risk in the market cap weighted strategies versus the Taiwan risk, which is the same either way. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and thank you for making it. You know, I think this is just such an amazing strategy. Have investors responded? Have you been able to raise assets? Is this working for you? You know, yeah. And I think the three-year mark was a, a was key for us um, because most people wait for to see what happens after three years. You know, even though we had outperformance in, in um, prior timeframes, people were waiting to see if it would persist. And thankfully, it did. We don't expect this stark of outperformance every year. I want to be clear. Um, it's just because we've had a lot of extreme events. Although we do expect freer countries to outperform in, in the very long run. Um, the short run, you know, anything can happen. So this year, I believe we've netted about 180 million. So we're currently at 250 million. So we more than doubled our assets in 2023. And most of that happened in March, right after the invasion of Ukraine. So I think that's when people really opened their eyes to autocracy risk. And also that's when we were approaching the three-year mark and it just kind of coincided. So, so I'm thankful for that. I, you know, I hate that it had to you know, take an extreme event for people, for investors to see the tail risk in investing in autocracies, but I don't think it was just Russia. I think China and their very heavy handed um, actions also contributed to this. It's funny because I was, you know, I had the TV on over the weekend during the, the, the party Congress recently. And I think for the party Congress, investors were just looking for anything, like any positive sign out of China. You know, we really want to believe, right? So, mm -hmm. but instead of just any sign, they got Hu Jintao getting very unceremoniously walked out. So, so that I think at first I was like, why is Bloomberg broadcasting the party Congress like we're C-SPAN or something. But then I realized, oh, for investors to see that, it was really helpful to realize yeah. how, how different the political risk is in these emerging markets and especially the more autocratic ones. You know, yeah. back in, back in, you know, 10 years ago, people used to say, a lot of investors used to say, you know, markets like authoritarianism. Larry Fink 
is on record saying this. You know, you can you can Google that on YouTube. Larry Fink markets like totalitarianism, and you can see him saying that. And now people are realizing that totalitarianism is the opposite of certainty, which was his reasoning for why markets liked it. It's mm -hmm. it's total capriciousness, and you don't know what's going to happen. And so. A lot of investors are no longer willing to take that tail risk. Yeah, that is really a good point. And I'm so glad that your business is thriving. I would assume that this growth in ESG assets has helped you, but you don't consider yourself an ESG emerging markets ETF, do you? Yeah, the way that the industry defines ESG is security level, and we don't use any security level ESG metrics. Although the metrics that I did describe for um, the country level, I would say are, you know, obviously, you know, human freedom is definitely ESG in spirit. So mm -hmm. this is kind of like an ESG in spirit, you know, by default, we have two types of investors. We have the type that says I'm investing in this because I believe the freer countries will outperform. And then we have another type that says, I'm investing in this because I don't want to fund autocracies with my investments. And those are our more ESG investors. And then we have some that are an overlap of both. So I personally am, am both. I, I would be both too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think most people are actually. Uh, but uh, United States is actually number 15 out of 162. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. I just <laughs> wanted to give some point of reference. For yes. the audience listening, list, listening, what is number one? Do you know? Do you have the list still up? Yeah. Um, so, so Taiwan is number nineteen. Number okay. one is Switzerland. Ah, got it. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been certainly enjoyable, Perth. Where can listeners go to learn more about life and liberty indexes and um, potentially invest in your product? Yeah. So the ETF um, site is freedometf.com. The index site is lifeandlibertyindexes.com. Great. And we will have all that information uh, listed on the show notes. Do you feel that you're contributing to spreading freedom around the world? Is that something that's personal, you know, important to you? Do you feel that you're contributing to it? You know, um, that would be a tall order. Um, so I don't know if we are worthy of that yet, but I think we, we have successfully changed the conversation among investors. Uh, at least we're starting to. So for me, this is more like a form of expression. So, you know, creating this index was a way for me to express my preferences in how I want to invest in emerging markets. And we're creating a way for others to be able to express the same. So that's really the goal here. And if we can, um, you know, drive a change in the conversation so that people are more aware of some of these autocracy risks and uh, other ways of investing besides market cap weighting in the emerging markets, then I think I'd be happy with that. Yeah. I personally think you are spreading freedom around the world and I really commend your efforts um, loved having you on the show. Love your product. I'm a big fan. So I will continue to root you on and help you in any way I can. Thank you for sharing your time with my audience and really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for listening to Investing the Templeton Way. Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. To view the show notes and resources mentioned in today's show, head to investingthetempletonway.com.